Thank you. I'd like to thank Intelligence Squared for inviting me to participate in this debate, addressing the motion that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China. I think the selection of today's date could not be more apt, neatly sandwiched between yesterday's US presidential election and tomorrow's opening of the 18th National Congress of the Communist Party of China that will usher in the next generation of Chinese leadership. The contrast between the nail-biting finish of one with the carefully choreographed outcome of the other could hardly be more stark. I'd like to begin by addressing the subtext to the motion, namely that the Chinese model of government has done more for the Chinese than the Western model of government ever could. This rather presupposes that within this room, we share a common understanding of what is meant by the Chinese model of government and the term Western liberal democracy. As I doubt this is so, permit me to give my perspective. 63 years on from the end of the civil war in China, the Communist Party still remains firmly in control. However, the policies of the last 30 years, in particular the evolution of capitalism with Chinese characteristics, have moved light years away from the ideologies of the Mao era, which thrived on constant social and economic turmoil and led, amongst other things, to the disasters of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, during which millions died. The key characteristics of the current Chinese model of government was seen to me to be an ever-growing bureaucracy intent on preserving at all costs one-party rule. Recognition that this can only be achieved if the population at large believes the economic benefits being reaped outweigh the fact that they have no say in the selection of those who govern them. An economy that is still largely command-led, structured around successive five-year plans supported by huge government investment in state-controlled enterprises and infrastructure. Vigorous suppression of dissent through strict censorship and harassment persecution of any who dare to speak out against the system or its injustices. And subordination of the rights of the individual to the wider public interest as determined by the state. Set against this are what I see as the typical characteristics of a Western liberal democracy. Recognition of the essential role of political parties as channels for the expression of differing views within society and a basis for orderly change of government from time to time. Bias towards a predominantly market-led economy in which the government's priorities are to nurture innovation, support free enterprise, and ensure that the needs of vulnerable sectors of the community are met. Absolute commitment to the rule of law, freedom of thought and expression, protection of individual rights and freedoms within a just and fair society. There is no doubt that the Chinese model of government, however described, has delivered extremely impressive economic growth, lifting many millions out of poverty, and in the meantime, greatly enriching some. But the speed and scale of China's development is not exactly unprecedented in more democratic societies. Look at the rise of Great Britain as a global economic power in the second half of the 19th century, or the emergence of the United States from the Great Depression of the 1930s to become the most prosperous and powerful nation in the world. Conversely, in the latter part of the 20th century, the Soviet Union's socialist model of centrally controlled economic development, which China initially sought to emulate, collapsed, unable to fend off demands for political reform from within or compete effectively with the faster-growing market-driven economies of the West. To argue that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China is, in my view, an insult 
to the Chinese people. It implies that they are somehow not sufficiently grown up to aspire to electing their own leaders, as opposed to having them foisted upon them by means of a highly opaque process of balancing the various factions within the governing elite. Furthermore, anyone who argues that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China must also be prepared to acknowledge the perils that the nation faces if it doesn't begin to take some genuine steps in the direction of political reform. All around the world, previously unshakable authoritarian regimes are being challenged and overthrown. No wonder China is keeping a nervous eye on developments in North Africa and the Middle East. It took the self-immolation of just one persecuted street vendor to trigger revolution in Tunisia. In Tibet and Sichuan, the tally of self-immolations has risen to nearly 60 since 2009 and shows no sign of abating. The current Chinese model of government is founded on the belief that as long as the economy keeps growing and standards of living rising, stability can be maintained and the population at large will tolerate, amongst other things, an ever-widening wealth gap between the cities and countryside, restriction of personal rights and freedoms, and the continuing crushing of any form of dissent. This strategy, in my view, is fundamentally flawed. The current form of government is under challenge from a rising tide, not just of discontent, but real anger among sectors of the population that are increasingly disaffected. No one knows exactly how many incidents of popular unrest, commonly referred to as mass incidents, are occurring. Some estimates put it at 180,000 in 2011, whilst others believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Little wonder that China is now spending more on internal security than on the funding of its military. Popular anger and increasingly bold resistance to government authorities is being fueled by forced land acquisitions, arbitrary land grabs by provincial officials, often to make way for totally unnecessary development, empty high-rises and shopping malls, roads to nowhere. The collapse of shoddily constructed schools in the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, tainted baby milk and other food safety scandals, environmental degradation have led and are leading to unprecedented confrontations between ordinary citizens and the government. Still, all too often, Instead of acknowledging shortcomings and responding to justified concerns, the authorities' reaction is to punish the protesters for disturbing social harmony. Corruption is now rife at every level of the Chinese political machine. Power is concentrated in the hands of a privileged clique, perhaps no more than 400 families, who are bound by a common purpose to protect their mutual vested interests and capacity for self-enrichment. The communist vision of proletarian supremacy within an egalitarian state has been subsumed by greed and injustice, exemplified by the often shameless flaunting by party cadres of ill-gotten wealth and a culture of impunity from moral and even criminal culpability. No one wants to see China go the way of the Soviet Union in the aftermath of its disintegration. The gains that China has made in the past three decades are far too precious to put at risk. In an age when the dissemination of information via the internet and the blogosphere is unstoppable, to continue to try and stifle dissatisfaction and dissent is about as futile as King Canute's legendary attempt to stop the tide coming in. Current abuses of power and the pervading lack of transparency and accountability simply will not be tolerated indefinitely. Everywhere in the world, the need for change is the mantra. Rather than waiting for popular unrest to force change, China's leaders should now be actively planning for an orderly relaxation of its iron grip on political power and a move towards greater openness and participatory politics. My conclusion, 
The central government needs a new model that it can nail its colors to. Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Hong Kong played a crucial role in kickstarting China's economic revolution. Under Deng Xiaoping's open door policy, special economic zones were established on the border with or in close proximity to Hong Kong, with the express purpose of inducing Hong Kong industrialists to move their manufacturing operations across the border, where land and labor were so much cheaper. This marked the start of how southern China morphed into the factory of the world, piggy banking on Hong Kong investment that provided employment for millions of migrant workers and provided the formula to attract wider foreign investment. The Hong Kong economic model clearly worked. And I believe that the Chinese central government can and should look to Hong Kong to test a new model of more democratic government that could be extended progressively into the mainland. Thanks to the terms of the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the concept of one country, two systems enshrined in our constitution, the basic law, Hong Kong people enjoy the fundamental freedoms associated with a modern liberal democracy, namely the rule of law and an independent judiciary, freedom of expression including freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom from arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, zero tolerance of corruption, the promise, not yet realized, of the right to elect our head of government and legislature by means of universal suffrage. Far from being bad for China, it is essential that the coming leadership in Beijing begin to draw up a blueprint for reform that provides Chinese people through a process of evolution, not revolution, with the fundamental rights and freedoms associated with liberal democratic government. There are plenty of studies to confirm the link between rising levels of economic well-being and the openness of the political system. A democratically based system of governance will not only sustain China's long-term economic growth, but will also enrich Chinese society and the world at large. And the perils of not doing so are becoming increasingly acute. So ladies and gentlemen, I beg to oppose the motion before you this evening. Thank you.